this. We were becoming so wise, so knowledgeable. Um, I want to remind you of something that I realized. Oh no, I I I decided not to. Um, I want to remind you that you you have the textbook on web assign. You click where it says ebook, and and that opens the textbook. I was going to open it, but I forgot. And I guess. I should remind you that there's web assign due today and there's um and there's written homework due today. So you still have time to do it, you have the whole day. Um and I feel like I have to remind you how to look at your rating because I have the feeling that half of you don't realize where it is. You can see a lot more than your scores. Okay, so um, what is our wisdom so far? Uh, we know that the derivative of a constant is zero. We know that the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. We know that the derivative of e to the x is itself. We know that we know the product rule. Um, and and the last thing we learned was the quotient rule. So today mostly we're gonna do trigonometry. Good old trigonometry like um like you did when you were we last us and lattice. Um so um but before that I should do I should do a complicated example of the quotient rule because the thing with the quotient rule is that it makes messes. Um it makes it makes things very annoying, very complicated. <clears throat> so Let's do an example. Uh, but the good news is you can power through and you always make it to the end. And it makes, especially makes methods when you try to take more than one derivative. So, um, all right, so we're going to use the quotient rule. So the quotient rule says, take the denominator, square it, and then in the numerator, what you need to write is the denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. Uh, what we call in the business low t high minus i t low. And so, uh, so that's it. Well, now you take those derivatives that I wrote there. Um, so the derivative of x, I'm gonna memorize pretty fast. Um, because it's the power rule. It's one times x to the zero, x to the zero is one. Uh, I need to do the derivative of x minus one squared. So I have, I have two ways of doing this. <clears throat> and one is better than the other. Um, 
if I I could I could expand this I could expand the square a sum of uh, the square of a sum is the sum of the squares plus two times the product. And I could take the derivative of that. I, well, it's going to be pretty similar. I probably don't want to do that. Um, just because I want things to be factored. Um, because I better simplify this when I'm done. So what I'm going to do is write x minus 1 as a product and use the product rule. So um, the derivative is the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. So that's how many x minus 1s are there. There's two of them. So that's 2 times x minus 1. <clears throat> So, so that's the derivative, and the bottom is x minus one. When you take an exponential and then another exponent, and then uh, you take another power of that, the exponents uh, multiply. So that's that's going to be a four. But it's a four because they multiply, not because they added, or because you took two to the two. Okay, so. Um, so that's it. That's the first derivative. Now, I if if the if the problem was the first derivative, I would probably leave it here because I'm done, uh, and I don't. I don't if, there's no, if there's no need to simplify, then there's no need to simplify. But since I have to take the derivative of this, um, uh, I I better I really really should um i really should make it the simplest i can before taking the derivatives um otherwise i'm just gonna make my life very hard Um, simplify f prime before. By the way, the second derivative, in case you forgot, is the derivative of the derivative. So the first derivative is um, this whole thing. And the thing is, there's x minus ones everywhere, which is why I like to have that simplified. Um, if you if you, if you have a power of something in the denominator, you tend to have it. It tends to cancel out after you do the the quotient rule. So it's better to not multiply things out because they tend to cancel when you do the quotient rule. Things often like to cancel afterwards. So. Um, I gotta be very careful not to mess up the algebra, but if I pull out an x minus one from the numerator, well, the first term is left with an x minus one and the second term is left with a two x. And then one from the top cancels with one of them in the bottom and I'm left with three in the bottom. And in the numerator, I have x minus 1 minus 2x. Um, and that's uh, one, 1 x minus 2x. That's 1 minus 2 is negative 1. x minus 1 is x minus 1 cubed. And now these don't cancel because 1 is the opposite of x plus 1, and the other is x minus 1. So, um, did I have to do this step? Um, no, but if I didn't, I would spend a much, much longer time taking the, the next derivative. So now take the derivative of, of this thing over here.
And again, it's a fraction when you take a derivative of a fraction, pretty much always you get, you still get fractions. So let's do the quotient rule. Woo! Woo! Four neighbors. So the square of the denominator, and then low d high, which I could do in my head, but maybe it's a good idea to not do it right away because I will make a mistake. Minus pi uh, pi with no derivatives and d low. Well, I have to take a derivative of x minus one cubed there, which is, um, well, it's unfortunate, but if I think of what could have been, if I hadn't simplified, I'm very happy. Um, so. Can you go back for a sec? Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Thank you uh, for telling me and also for giving me time to copy it into the next slide. X minus one to the sixth. There we are. Okay. So the that first derivative that I have, uh, that one is easy. One is just negative one. Uh, this one, well, when we know, when we learn the chain rule, we'll know. Um, we'll know better ways to do it, but I don't have them right now. So I'm just going to need to expand this. Either use the product rule twice. Let's use the product rule twice. Um, oh, yeah, also the square I already did. So if I write the cube as the square times the thing, I, I can now use the product rule. And that is going to be x minus one squared prime, which conveniently I did in the previous page, plus the derivative of the second, which is um, which is very easy. Um, so. This equals two x minus one. It's here. Uh, it's here. I'm not gonna do the same thing twice. That would be that would be not lazy, and I'm I'm lazy, especially for things that I have no reason to do. So. That's going to be 2x minus 1 times x minus 1. And now this derivative, well, the derivative of x is 1, the derivative of a constant is 0. So that's, so this is 2x minus 1 squared plus uh, x minus 1 squared. So we got 3x minus 1 squared. Okay, it looks like the, pro like the power rule works for this. Um, for this function, which it does, but um, you don't know why. Okay, so now that I've done those derivatives that I need to do, if I just keep going, x minus one cubed, uh, this derivative is just negative one. The derivative of negative x is negative one. By the power rule, the derivative of a constant is, is zero. And now I have, I'm just copying negative x minus one. And now I'm just copying the derivative that I just computed. And now I could definitely simplify this, but I'm not going to, because nobody's asking me to. Well, it would be. 
like you cancel two x minus ones from the top and the bottom, but it doesn't matter. I don't care. <clears throat> I don't need it for anything. It was I was just asked to compute the second derivative. Uh, so, so there it is. That's the second derivative. Are there any questions? So unless you specifically ask us to uh, simplify on like the test or like homework, we don't have to simplify. That's right. Uh, but if you're if if you're in the middle, so your answer, I don't need you to simplify. But the work that happens in between, you need yourself to simplify because if you don't simplify, problems become impossible. So. Like I, like I did here, it, it wouldn't become impossible. It would become longer and more complicated. Uh, and if I ask you to the third derivative, this as it is written, it would be a nightmare to take the derivative off. But if I simplify it, I could do it. So I don't need you to simplify your answers, but you need to simplify everything that happens in between all the time. All right. All right, so let's do some trigonometry. Woo! It's gonna be so much trick today. You're not even, you're not ready for the amount of triangles I'm gonna draw. So the derivative of sine, what is the derivative of sine? Um, some of you might, might know it, it's cosine. Um, some of you might um, guess it's cosine, like what else could it be? Uh, but we, we don't know that, I don't know that. So to figure what the derivative of sine is, I need to, I need to go write, down, write it down. The derivative is the limit I get when I plug in x plus h and I subtract what I get plugging in h and then I divide by h and then I let h go to zero and I see what the limit is. Um, and this is, it doesn't look like it's going to simplify in any way. Um, but uh, it could because I know, because I know my trigonometry. I know things I can do with this. What can I do with this? What do you know from your trigonometry? Maybe I don't remember. Isn't there some rules where it's like cosine squared something plus one equals sine x something like something like that? Is that kind of what you're talking about? Uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't uh, even remember. So, um, if you, uh, so there is some rule. So. What you need to know, what you need to know is that there is some rule that tells you what happens when you plug in a sum into a sign. Doesn't matter. You don't need to know what goes on the right hand side because you can just Google that. But if you don't know what you're Googling, uh, you know, actually, cosine. Um, square plus one something like if if this shows up actually you know what shows up um a list of everything so um i guess you only need to go through here until you find the one you want so um everyone look here and decide which ones you wanted uh the, the one i want is the one where i take the sign the sign of a sum 
and and it tells me it writes it in the, in a different way in terms of the sine and cosine of the original angles. Um, like in practice, you don't need to memorize everything, but you need to know in, you need to know enough to to know what kind of stuff exists that you can find, you know. So the important thing to know is that there is something that I can do with the sine of a plus b. And that's something is um, is this. So um, so instead of a plus b, I have x plus h. So what's going to happen with this is that this is going to become Sine of x cosine h, uh, sine of h cosine x. Okay, it looks like I made it more complicated. Maybe I did. Um, but I can I can solve this um, if you let me do trigonometry for the rest of the class. So. Maybe probably the way to guess what why I would do what I'm about to do is to plug in numbers to, to plug in small numbers for h and see well cosine of h. So cosine of h is approaching one. So the numerator So this is looking like what? This is looking like it's approaching sine of x. Of course, you have to remember that sine of that sine of zero is zero. Cosine of zero is one. This is approaching sine of x. This is approaching zero. This is approaching sine of x. Of course, it's still going to be zero over zero because that's what derivatives like to do. But um, I feel like somehow. I have a term here. I, I need to I need to keep these together, for example, because they're both approaching the same thing and I'm subtracting them. So what I'm gonna do is first of all split it into two fractions. Um, first what? First I'm gonna take is this term sine of h cosine x divided by h. And then I'm going to take the stuff that's left. And the thing is, I'm going to be able to compute both of these limits. Um, so everything's going to work out. So this is the limit of sine of h over h uh, multiplied by something that has no h. So for all I care, it's a constant. And the other, in the other term, what I have is a sine x in both summons. So I can also pull it out. Um, and just remember that if I divide sine of x by sine of x, I get one, not zero. So what I need, what I need to compute is the limit as h approaches zero of sine of h over h and the limit of cosine h minus one divided by h. If I have these two, then, then I'm happy. And since I think the derivative of sine is cosine, we should, I mean, I should guess what those are based on the answers. Um, so now I'm just looking for these two numbers. Um, that's all I need. <clears throat> the problem is that 
I have no clue how to do this thing. Why did that, um, where did that one come from? The one, yeah. For the sign um, of X? So the sign one, H? The one came from writing the numerator over here uh, as sine of X times cosine H minus one. If I multiply this by oh. this, I get the original numerator. Thank you. <clears throat> you put a zero there, everything gets messed up forever. If you put a zero there, because this, so I guess I should try to, um, if I make H equals zero, sine of H divided by H becomes zero divided by zero. So sine of zero is zero. So well, unsurprisingly, that's not defined. And cosine of zero minus one divided by zero. Well, cosine of zero is one. So that becomes zero divided by zero, which is also sadness. <clears throat> OK, so. Um, so um, I'm going to compute those limits, and then I'm going to come back to this formula, and then I'm going to finish the, the derivative. Actually, before we forget what the formula is, um, what we're going to get is that the limit of sine of h divided by h is one and the limit of cosine h minus one divided by h is zero so the answer we're going to get here is one times cosine x plus zero times sine x. So we're, we are gonna get that the derivative of sine is cosine. <clears throat> so the question is why are we gonna get, it? why is this limit gonna be, is this limit gonna be one? That's where we're going. <clears throat> so, the way we're going to do this, so this is a super important limit that you should remember forever from this day on. If you put it into a calculator, um, so if you put it into a calculator, you'll see one of two things. Either you'll see a number very close to one, or you'll see a number very close to five divided by 180 which is what happens if your calculator is in degrees, like a boosters calculator. <clears throat> no, I'm kidding. Degrees are fine, just not for taking derivatives. Um, so what are we gonna do? Well, what I'm gonna do is um, draw my favorite thing. Uh, well, I was gonna say, I don't know if I can call this a circle. This is hard. Uh, draw a circle, draw a unit circle. And here I have something I want to compute the sign of. And try to remember what I'm doing. So, an animal is Liger. Where, where is Google coming up with these animals? I don't think Ligers are very happy. So, um, okay. So, if you remember your trigonometry, so this is supposed to be the unit circle. So, the radius is supposed to be one. Um, now, where am I going to find sine of h divided by h here? I'm probably not going to find it anywhere, but um, one thing 
one thing I know is that if I have a right triangle with an angle H and, and hypotenuse one, that the opposite that the opposite side has a length sine of the angle. So there's the sine and where's H? Uh, H is here. H is, uh, is the length of the circle. That's where radians are, right? Um, the length, the, the size in radians of an of an arc is um, sorry of an angle is the length of the arc that fits in there. So I want to say that the sine of h is smaller than h. I want to say that that is always true. Um, and I can, it looks convincing, I mean, I think it looks convincing, but one way to, um, one way to really be convinced is to draw this line here. Let's call this, let's call this segment AB. So definitely sine of H is smaller than AB because I have a right triangle and, and I'm just saying that the hypotenuse is bigger than the, the one of the sides. And that's definitely always true. <clears throat> and the other thing I want to say is that this hypotenuse that I just drew is smaller than H. And that is just because AB is smaller than the arc. Um, and the straight line, we have this blind belief that it's the shortest path. It is. I don't know why we know that, but we know that. So putting these together, I have, I can conclude that the sine of H is smaller than this length AB over here, which is smaller than H. So if, if it's smaller than a thing that is smaller than H, it's smaller than H. Um, so that's half of what I want. I don't know why I drew this line. I mean, I know why, but I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have. So, um, so far, I said that the yellow thing is smaller than the red thing. And I knew that because I drew this blue thing in between. Uh, and I know the blue thing is bigger than one and smaller than the other. So, so that's half of it. I know that sine of H is smaller than H. Um, and from, from here, I can divide by H and I can figure out that sine of H divided by H is smaller than one. So if I want this limit to be equal to one, well, now I know that it's smaller than one. I only need to see that it's bigger than one. Are there any questions? I know you weren't ready for to go back to trigonometry today. Uh, so it's normal to feel disoriented. But do ask me questions if you have them. All right, so that must mean that everyone believed me that the sine of an angle is smaller than the angle. 
Well, also, if you if you draw the graphs, you can see that the the graph of sine indeed looks like first of all looks like this line is tangent. Looks like sine prime of zero is zero is one. Uh, but it also looks like the graph is always below the line, although it kind of gets confusing here because they get very close together. But oh, we did because I don't because I don't know that the limit is equal to one yet. I'm getting there. Uh, if you show that something is smaller than or equal to one, and you show that it's greater than or equal to one, then you know it's one. Uh, so I'm halfway there by that measure. So, um, the, so I want to say another thing. I want to say that the sign So what's the thing? It's more than a tangent. <clears throat> oh no, not the sign. Uh, sorry, I was confused. Uh, of course, of course, the sign is more than the tangent. I want to say that h is more than the tangent. So uh, what I'm going to do is draw draw the picture again. And this is, so I'm following what the book says. And this is where the, the book, I'm like only 90% convinced that they're not lying to me. So if, I'm, if I draw the same picture again, this is a unit circle. I still have h here. h is the arc length here. And the thing is that the tangent I can find I can find here because um, this triangle has adjacent side uh, length one, so the opposite side has to be the length has to be tangent of x. Just because the opposite divided by the adjacent is a tangent, if the denominator in that fraction is one, uh, well, then the tangent might be uh, must be one, must be the opposite. So, opposite over adjacent equals the tangent of h. This equals the opposite divided by one. Well, this means that opposite equals tangent, like it happens in this picture. So now the book goes and tells you that the that the red arc is smaller than the blue segments is shorter, and it's true. Um, it's just I don't know if I'm convinced. So what they do is they draw sort of you put a mirror in here, and you and you draw this tangent line here. So, they draw those two yellow light um, lines there. And now they say, I think the red is smaller, is shorter than the yellow. Um, And why do you think that? Well, um, what they say, and I'm not sure that I find this convincing, is that if you drew the whole circle, nope. If you drew the whole circle, then the yellow segments, with the yellow segments, you would make uh, 
you would you would have a polygon into which the the circle is inscribed, and they say the length of the circle, the length of the circumference, is always smaller than the perimeter of the polygon. And you make of that what you want. I'm I'm not gonna, you know. I'm not gonna go any further into justifying that, but I'm 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 just want to say I'm not very convinced, even though I know it's true. So um, one thing, so if I believe this, then I definitely know that the yellow is smaller than the blue. Um. I know that from the same reasoning I had before, which is that well, these parts, um, this part is the same. This part they have in common, and this part, this is the short side of a, uh, or the short, or the, it's one of the two short sides of a right triangle, and this is the hypotenuse, and the the short sides are always smaller than the hypotenuse. So putting it all together, the red is smaller than the yellow, which is smaller than the blue, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to say that the tangent of H was smaller than, <clears throat> it was bigger than H. So um, so that's, that's it, that's um, pretty much done with the trigonometry. Um, if you, if you're unhappy with this, uh, well, you can, you can look at the book. You can ask me later to go through it again, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, this is not a trigonometry class. Uh, I do want you to know what the derivative of sine is, why, why it's cosine. I want you to know why it's cosine, but we only need to figure out why it is once. And then after that forever, we can say, we know it's cosine and we're done. So, um, so far, I know um, that the sine is smaller than h and that h is smaller than the tangent. So from here, I'm doing this for positive angles. I should do if I was doing this correctly, I would have to think of what happens for negative angles, but um, pretty much the same. From this, I can divide it by h and figure out that this function is smaller than one. And here, if I write tangent as sine divided by cosine, I can, um, well, the cosine is close to one. So I can multiply by cosine. And I can divide by h to conclude that the function I really care about is bigger than cosine. So in conclusion, I have two inequalities where um, the function I don't understand the limit of is in the middle. And now what theorem from the menu am I going to use to compute this limit? The squeeze theorem? Squeeze theorem, thank you, Dustin. By the squeeze theorem, so remember the squeeze theorem says that if you have a function uh, that's stuck between two functions, um, the, the um, and the so let me just write it down uh, the limit 
So cosine is continuous. The limit of cosine is the cosine of zero. That's what it means to be continuous. And the cosine of zero is one. Uh, one is also continuous. The limit of one is one. So if you have a function squeezed between two functions that have the same limit, this means that the limit of the thing in between uh, is also that same limit. So, uh, so that's it. <clears throat> Um, so here's the, the squeezing. So I said the function is between cosine and one. So between these two red functions that both approach one, there's a function whose limit I don't know. Um, but um, so blue is sine of x over x. Clearly, uh, well, it's in between them, and the squeeze theorem says it has no, it has nothing I can do. It can do but approach one. At zero, it's undefined. At zero, it's zero divided by zero. But nonetheless, uh, I can fix that just by putting it a point there. Uh, the limit, the limit is one. And we, and we just proved it. So um, that was, so if you go back, so that was the first promise I made that the limit of sine of h over h was one. I need to figure that out, figure out the limit of cosine h minus one divided by h. But now that I'm, so much wiser. This is so much easier. As you are about to see. Because I can do this limit. Turns out I can do by doing your favorite thing in the world which is multiplying by the conjugate. Well, your favorite thing in the world is factoring degree two polynomials, but your second favorite thing is multiplying by the conjugate. I, and I normally do this for square roots because multiplying by the conjugate of a sum gives me two squares. But the thing is, um, I like having cosine squared as well because cosine squared has the amazing property that it that is, being sine squared one minus sine squared. So the thing is cosine minus one times cosine plus one is the difference of squares. Like every time you multiply uh, a sum by a difference. And the denominator, I'm just gonna leave like that. I'm not annoyed by having cosine of h plus one in the denominator because that is approaching two. And if it approaches two, that means it's not gonna bother me. The denominator is approaching zero, but it doesn't look complicated. So cosine squared minus one, I can simplify. It's gonna have to do something with sine squared because if sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, that means that cosine squared is one minus sine squared. So I can write the numerator as one minus sine squared of h. And now there's ones that cancel. Can't believe we would be so lucky. So wonderful. Sine squared h and now this is still looking like zero divided by zero however now i see in here a sign of h over h 
which is my new favorite limit. So there's sine of h over h. And then if I take out sine of h over h, sine of h of the numerator, I'm left with negative sine of h. And here, I'm left with this denominator that doesn't vanish. So I don't need to do more work because this has limit 1. I just computed it. And this, what it approaches is negative sine of 0. This is a continuous function. I can plug in, and that's going to be the limit. 0 divided by 1 plus 1. The limit of this is 0. So by the, the limit law for the product, the limit of the product is the product of the limits. And the first limit is 1, second limit is 0. So this limit is 1. That is, you go this way, and then you say that 1 times 0 is 1. And then you fail. I failed. You didn't fail. You would have never done that. Um, and that was my second promise that the second limit would be zero. Oh, we don't have time for cosine. Anyway, look at my second promise. It's here. I said that it would be zero. So now you have the limits I promise you. You can plug it in. You know the limit of sine. And tomorrow we will take, uh, tomorrow we'll just tell you a limit of cold and it's negative sign, the derivative. And that's it. Um, I'll see you all tomorrow. Uh, it's my office hours right now, so you're free to stick around and ask me questions.